Well, uh, hi, um, I'm Dick Thompson, uh, and uh, this is my wife, Suzanne, and uh, we have just up front, we've been married uh, not quite 45 years, uh, actually next month in May. And uh, uh, I'm the, the new pastor for Seasoned Adult Ministry here at uh, Calvary Community. I've been here uh, since October, so I'm still very much learning about the place. But uh, we recognize that today we're talking about uh, our marriage, and it's a joy to, to share uh, some of that with you uh, today. Um, so Suzanne is going to get us started. So share with, a little bit about yourself and yeah, how well, we met. Maybe. Yeah, well, I'm just, I'm just say I'm Suzanne, and I'm um, you know married to Dick. We have a daughter and we have a grandson, and um, we have been in this area for many years. But Calvary, as a community to become involved in, is new, fairly new to me, and uh, really looking forward to. Finding, I'm in the 301 class now and finding your ministry. And um, uh, it was part of when they asked if we would do this, I thought, I'm doing it. <laughs> I want to become part of this church. And, and that means being willing to be known and in order to know others. And so I'm, it's kind of a big place to start, um, but we want to be known and we want to know others. So um, after I talked with Sarah, it gave me even more impetus to to want to do this. So here we go. So I'm going to start, right? So you, you start. How, how did we meet? Okay. <laughs> well, I had a sense of uh, Dick Thompson. I transferred to UCSB as a junior, and um, I had become a Christian in young life. I was not churched as a kid. Um, my family of origin is complicated. And my main memory of church as a, as a child was when my dad made a summary decision to leave the church and I would get mail, Dear Susie, from the second grade teacher, we miss you. <laughs> it's funny. And I think now I thank God for that teacher. It's my main memory of church. So anyway, they were wondering where I had gone. And um, I got involved with some friends in high school and became a Christian after the girl in front of me turned one day and said, do you accept Jesus as your savior? I don't want you to go to hell. I mean, it was really dramatic because her sister had started in a college group and she was really worried about me. And that started the conversation and got my attention. And we started going to um, Young Life. And over a period of a couple of years, um, I became a Christian uh, through Young Life, but still didn't have any sense of what it was like to be a part of a church. So when I went to UCSB, I got involved in InterVarsity, and um, uh, it was a really important way for me to get to know more people because when you transfer as a junior to a four-year college, it's kind of hard to find your place. They don't do all the freshman orientation and all that. So... Uh, I'm so thankful that somehow, actually, it was two girls in the dorm room down the mm. hall who came and knocked on my door and, and introduced themselves and asked if I would want to come to InterVarsity. And I thank God for them, too, um, because it was it was extremely important and grounding for me. But in that first year as a junior, um, people would be talking about different people and say, oh, yeah, you know, Dick Thompson, you know, he's, he's in the junior abroad program. He's studying in France and he's a leader and, you know, all this, you know, different things about him. And, you know, so I kind of knew, you know, this guy. Dick Thompson was coming back the next year. And sure enough, my senior year, um, you know, he was there and he was interesting and um, seemed like he was maybe going to start dating one of my friends who had come and knocked on my door and invited me to InterVarsity. So it was like, well, I'd go along sometimes and, you know, chat with her and visit him. He had slept through a French exam one day and we went over to encourage him and but she was kind of like you know maybe the person of interest and I was the person who came along but that fizzled very early on and you know that was a good thing for me um and during that year one of the complaints among the female students or you know participants was the lack of initiative and lack of clarity around having the opportunity to get to know the young men because dating was already, you know, the, all the scripts, social scripts for courtship and all that were had long before started to dissolve and things were really ambiguous. So it would be like, well, you know, you want to hang out and have some coffee, you know, <laughs> that would be like, 
<laughs> what does that mean? You know, <laughs> so it was all fairly low key, and there were some people who were starting to pair off, if you will, and it's it, you know it's our senior year, um, and I remember finding Dick to be uh, really uh, kind of a catalyst. He was fun to talk to. He was interesting. He seemed really serious about his faith. Um, I was still really a newbie as a Christian. I was a religious studies major at a secular university, which didn't exactly help me understand the Bible. <laughs> but it was good. It was it was really, um, mm. uh, really challenging and helped me to think about my faith um, and drove me to understand my faith in new ways in InterVarsity in that context. Um, anyway, I can remember vividly, I, I don't have the greatest memory, but I remember going in an university meeting once and kind of like he was just there talking with people, you know, very social. I was a little bit more, more of an introvert, which doesn't mean I'm shy or timid, but that I'm not as likely in a group to immediately like, you know, show up. I, I like one-on-one -on -one and smaller groups, but I remember going over and saying, Hey, you know, you said we were going to get together sometime. Um, you know, that hasn't really happened. I don't remember what I said. I said something that like, I remember feeling comfortable enough because it was kind of in a joking, low key way. And he goes, well, you know, let's go on a bike ride. You know, I'm like, great. We all, we both had these old jalopy bikes that we rode around campus on. I said, that's great. I love to bike ride. So we planned a bike ride and our first date was 46 years ago, April 27th. That's, right. that's how significant it ended up being. And yeah. we both acted really athletic and we were <laughs> very funny looking back. Um, but we rode our bikes on like a Glen Annie road. I mean, like we went, you know, all day and we didn't pack any food. It was really poorly conceived and planned by either of us, but it was fun. It was really fun. And that really was catalytic. And, um, Next thing you know, we're jogging on the beach. I couldn't walk for three days after. And neither one of us liked to jog. We, I've yeah. never jogged since. <laughs> I only jog if I'm frightened and it's night. I want to get to my car. Right. But it's just the kind of stuff you do. But but the fact is that within a six-week period of time, environed around other Christians, um, and I was about we were about to graduate, and he was going to go to seminary, and I was going to go back to the Bay Area, and this is how steep a learning curve it was for, for, for me as an unturned person. I remember seeing him at the language labs and, you know, it's getting on toward finals and, you know, we're enjoying seeing each other more. We're studying a lot in the library. And, um, I, and I, I, I need to add in here that, uh, the, the first time my roommates ever saw me make sure I got to the library when it opened. Yeah. In the morning, because yeah. I knew I would be there when Suzanne was there. Yeah. It was like we were doing dating in the library. Yeah. Straight and we A's. Did, we, we, we both four out our last it quarter at UCSB because of that. It was great. But <laughs> but I remember seeing him and he said, well, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking of going to seminary. And I remember thinking, I didn't know the difference between a priest and a pastor. So I remember thinking, you know, wow, you know, he's such a fun and lively guy and you know really and I it took him a while to figure out what I was thinking and he's like no I'm not going to be a priest I'm going to be a pastor so little did I know that you know soon after I would be in Pasadena with him on the steep learning curve and not only understanding what pastoral ministry was mm -hmm. but what seminary was all about and um, so we dated those six weeks. We were separated for the summer. Uh, I wouldn't necessarily encourage people in this direction, but I was living in the Bay Area. And after six weeks of dating very intentionally, we were talking about marriage. So I moved to Burbank to be in the region. He was in Pasadena and we got married in May. So it was, um, it was, it was quick, and God saw fit to protect us <laughs> because we didn't know nearly enough about ourselves or each other, but we can talk about that later. But he's been really good and gracious. And without the uh, Christian community, uh, we would have gone off the rails 
at different times. And we were protected and preserved, and maybe some of those, a couple of those stories could come out. But that's kind of like from my vantage point. Yeah, just to, just to build on that, uh, <clears throat> kind of you know, scrolling forward from there. So we were in, the, in seminary. Uh, we got married. Uh, I was 23, and Suzanne was 22. When we were married, so we we started out young, and uh, and, and we we both uh, basically were kind of putting each other through grad school. Uh, Suzanne was help working at these jobs, interesting jobs, put it mildly, to <laughs> while I was in seminary, and uh, I squeezed my three year seminary career into five uh, because I was dragging my feet about whether I really really wanted to do this or not, and so uh, we really kind of helped each other get through all the graduate school stuff and help pay for that. And we, you know, the stories are just all common. We didn't have any money. You know, we, we just, we lived very, very close to the bone, but we did it together. And uh, uh, I think that was a, was a lot of learning right there in, in uh, how to be, how to be married. Um, I, you know, the, the early years of our marriage, we, you know, you could think about our marriage over 45 years, those early years were very much trying to figure out how to do life and how to do life together. Um, I was interning in churches, uh, you know, so I was working some pretty long hours and, uh, and uh, you know, we can maybe come back to this, but I didn't do a real good job of balancing work and, and family. I, I really don't think I did well with that at all. Uh, but you know, that was some of the things we had to learn, learn and work through. Um, after seminary, um, uh, then I began to take calls and the first church was in Redondo Beach, was there for a very short time, 17 months. Our daughter was born. Uh, there and then we moved down to San Diego, where I, I was an assistant pastor in the church in Point Loma, San Diego, for four years. Uh, and uh, Suzanne was had a whole lot of things going on in her in, in her master's degree. Got that we got that done, and she began began to work in the, in uh, using that degree in, in the church where we both uh, where we were both serving. Um, and um, yeah, and then we then we ended up in uh, North County, San Diego, and Ranch Bernardo. I'm going to go fast now, just going mm -hmm. through Ranch Bernardo the years as, as an associate pastor for eight years. And Julia, our daughter, we have one daughter. She's growing up, and she's these the elementary years, and uh, we're uh, we're learning how to how to be parents, you know, and how to how to be um, again how to balance this 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 life of ministry with uh, with a family, and uh, and then uh, yeah, then ended up in. Uh, um, in Westminster Presbyterian Church across the freeway from uh, Calvary for 19 years. I was the senior pastor at Westminster Presbyterian Church. And uh, so um, we've, you know, then, and then we were, ended up in Florida for five years and we're back here at Calvary. I'm kind of going fast through this, but uh, it was, uh, it's, uh, our journey has been, uh, gone through all kinds of things. And, uh, I, you know, I kind of don't know where to go with this after this, but, uh, um, I, I would say that. Um, <clears throat> yeah, what would you say about one that? thing? You know, it was the '70s, and I just have two particular anecdotes that might might be helpful in um, how how much things have changed. And one of them, I would say, is it was more common for people to marry and then see to some of those latter stages of becoming fully adult. You know, you're an adult, right. you know, the culture treats you as an adult. But there are a lot of milestones now that I think young people have. There are these unspoken new scripts that are like you need to hit a lot more markers and clear a lot more hurdles and get a lot more situated and a lot more stable. And then you marry. And, you know, I guess arguments could be made on both sides. But... There's something about going through some of those latter formational stages of coming into full adulthood uh, in the context of marriage because it's so formative. And you're more likely to have that formation happen around and with regard to the needs of someone else and not just your own. And also there's a certain sort of, um, you know, presumption in that, that, you know, we, we can, we know how to shape you know, and who we're meant to be. And then when we're fully realized, then we will mm -hmm. look for someone who can complement. All kinds of things start to kind of get kicked into, into motion there. And it kind of changes your, your, maybe your malleability, for lack of a better term, but marriage requires malleability or it gets really brittle. Um, and, 
it's harder to let go of some of those things. I think marrying at whatever age it comes, um, you know, is fine. God can meet you there and, and that's fine. But that's something I, a lot of our friends were just getting married and we were, you know, we didn't, hadn't ever balanced a checkbook. We didn't care about checkbooks. We were like, you know, um, it, it, we had to figure that out together. Some of those life skills. Anyway. I, I think I just, just, to, just to build on that, I, you know, we've heard, we've, we've used the analogy many times when we're talking with uh, couples getting ready to get married. We've, we've, we've used the analogy of, um, you know, you've got these two streams that are coming together. And when the two streams come together, there's turbulence uh, at, for a while downstream. And I think getting married at that stage of life um, that we had, we, we did, we fit, like Suzanne was saying, we had to figure things out together. Whereas if I think when you get married, when you're older, there's more force and current that has to be merged. That I think that actually is in some ways rougher uh, as you, as if you've been in your patterns of life for, for many, many years as an adult, we did it on the other uh, end of uh, the be beginning of adulthood and other folks are doing it when they want to have it all together. But then there's that turbulence of having to figure out how do you put these patterns together? Um, I'd like what Suzanne is saying, I agree. This is, is arguable. You know, folks could debate either way about it, but that's how we, that's how that was our experience. We, um, when we got married, we were quite young and somewhat clueless was, which was, which was good in some ways. And, um, we were both, I would say, I'll speak mainly for myself, very, very idealistic that's something I want to come back to a little bit later, something I brought into the marriage that needed to be worked on. Um, and um, I had a lot of preconceptions about things, and I didn't have a lot of self-awareness about sort of my patterns. And, you know, they just seem normative. You know, this is this the way things are, the way things should be. And, you know, so we early on, very early on, you know, we're in this new, fresh marriage. And, um, uh, and one of the first things we did was we made a decision that we'd get married uh, in May. And um, and then Dick would go back right away to finish his finals at Fuller. And I would like we 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 didn't have our apartment yet. You know, we would just stay with his parents. And then three weeks later, we agreed to participate in a full summer trainee program for people who were coming into ministry at a church in Fresno that was really a, a beautiful model in a lot of ways, but it, it required almost 24-7 participation in what they brought young people in, married and, and single, to this church, and there was a group of lay people committed to their spiritual formation, and part of the task was you lived with a family while you were there, sometimes more than one family. You rotated to different families. You had lots and lots of meetings where you analyzed how you did what you did. You were charged with starting a ministry that you could oversee that summer as part of like a practicum, and we'd been married three weeks. And <laughs> I'm more of a private person. And he yeah. had a very specific place to stand in this ministry. And I was like in the helper mode. Well, think about it. This is like in the, the mid 70s. And a lot of the stuff about, you know, you know, um, uh, you know, women don't lose yourself in the marriage and, you know, you know, um, you yeah. know, equality of opportunity. There are a lot of these things and a lot of pressures coming on us that you pick up like lint from the culture. And I hadn't done a deep dive yet. I hadn't thought through hmm. what all of that meant in terms of biblical marriage that came slowly and over time and was preservative for us. It was, it's, it's why we're still married, I would say. Um, but it, um, it, it puts some pressure on, on this new covenant <laughs> and my, my needs for privacy, his, his drive, you know, and finding that was kind of tricky. Um, but we then came back to seminary and, um, and there were some helpful communal things that Fuller provided and living, near other young married people going into ministry, that was really helpful. Um, but some of those fault lines began to be evident really early on, like three weeks in. That was kind of a lot of weight to put on a new covenant. And then three years in, what do we decide to do? So um, 
Yeah. Um, <laughs> so uh, it, 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 while at Fuller, I, I it became a, a, a mission intern and I, I spoke French. I speak French and we studied in France. And so we explored the idea of doing ministry in France. And so I, I became a mission intern at Fuller Seminary to a seminary in, in north of Paris, you know, a little village called vos and uh, so we went over to explore the possibility of a call to ministry to France in the uh, Reformed Church in France. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> and uh, so I was taking classes in uh, at the seminary. And uh, it, it come our third uh, wedding anniversary, which is in May, May 29th. Uh, they explain our living conditions. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, very, very important. We were living in community. Uh, we, we lived in an apartment that was uh, a servant quarters, it was formerly servant quarters in this large building that had been converted to a seminary. So we had... Uh, our little bedroom with a like a masonite thin wall between our room and another couple that were also young marrieds right on the other side of the of the wall. So for like like zero privacy and a shared bathroom and then a shared bathroom and then another newlywed couple right below us and, and all communal dining and, and we had uh, our common ground our common area was a hallway outside of our bedroom. So it was very intense, close in, way too close in. And I did speak French. And Suzanne was learning French uh, rapidly, I mean, amazing, amazingly rapidly. Um, and uh, so uh, we lived that in that community for uh, that no year. Money. So Sorry. by the time we get to May, and we had you know, no money once Negative again. Negative money. May 29th uh, is our, you know, is the, according coming to the end of that year in France, was a whole academic year. And came, come our anniversary, we weren't talking to each other. We, well. we did not know what to say to each other. We were just so drained emotionally. Um, I, I was not reading Suzanne. I was I was not able to understand what was happening with her. And uh, I, I think I also probably had a sense that she wasn't reading where I was. And uh, so we got up that morning, beautiful spring morning, and it sounds so romantic in France, and we weren't even hardly talking to each other. So um, in our, our, our apartment mates, it could all feel it. You, mm-hmm. You're living that close in community. That, that vibe goes beyond just us. And mm-hmm. so we decided, Susanna decided, uh, the best I could come up with is let's go for a walk. Let's just take a walk. And we left the seminary grounds, we went out on the street and uh, you walk down the street and most of the, the uh, houses on, in, in, that, in France have walls right on the street so you can't see inside. The yards are all gated and closed. They want their privacy. We're walking down a road, just a, just a, just an asphalt road with nothing to look at, not s- saying much of anything. Um, and we come by an open gate, very unusually an open gate. And we look into this, through this gate, and here's a beautiful garden. Gorgeous spring flowers that all went down over to the, the place. Sun just, river, and, all the way to the and, sun. and there was a house, and there's a garden in the front, and a house. And then there was a woman tending the garden in, in the front where she, where, where she could see us. And she could see us admiring her flowers. And she invited us in. She said, would you like to see my garden? And we said, well, yes, thank you. We would love to see your garden for all kinds of reasons. Change the subject. She, 100%. <laughs> and, and, and she said, would you like to see the rest of my garden? And we, you have more? And she walked us around the house to the four times the this, this, this space fr- uh, from the front to the back, led all the way down to the Seine River. She had flowers all over this backyard area. And as she toured us around in, the, in her garden, she had her clippers with her and she would nip samples of her, of her, of her flowers. And, and she just started giving them to us. Well, you have to have some of these. Oh, now you have to have some of these. Oh, you, you must have some of these. And, and, and by the time we were done, uh, we thanked her very much for the tour of her garden. And we walked out that gate back onto that road. And our arms were like this, both of us mm-hmm. carrying flowers. And, and I think I said, well, I think we better head home. And we were walking down the, the road. And, and, and I remember saying, just look at us. We're like rose parade floats, you know, and it kind of makes me want to weep even thinking about it. And mm-hmm. it's like grace, mm-hmm. you know, it, it's, and um, <laughs> we walked into our apartment and our two couples, uh, apartment mates had set up a table in the hall <laughs> and they could, they knew we were kind of struggling and they helped us celebrate our wedding anniversary. And we, 
plum pudding. We or took the flowers and we put them everywhere. Yeah. We 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 we, had, we ran mason out of vases. Jars, we just we just jars. laid them. Around. We had everything we could put water in. We yeah. put it in. We put flowers everywhere. And and our 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 apartment mates had gotten us gifts and they, they cooked this beautiful meal for us. And we sat there and we we celebrated. And and both of us that night when Susanna got back alone, we just said, "Wow, wow." They helped us keep covenant. So that, that's a that's a powerful story for us. A reminder mm -hmm. that we we have we're graced, you know, and, uh, mm -hmm. and that and that's what marriage is. You know? mm -hmm. Yeah, and you need you don't do it alone. It's not meant to be alone. But you know, and one yeah. thing about that woman that's so precious to me. I mean, I can see her white hair because I love to garden too, and these gloves. And yeah. she was a you know a seasoned gardener, and um, and just the joy she took in sharing it with us. And she'll never know. That's the thing we don't know. Right. Yeah. You don't know when you function as angel. Was she a Christian? Who knows. But when, she, when we could cut flowers for somebody else. Yeah. Right. Yeah, whatever that is. And you don't have to know, but she right. will never, I mean, maybe she'll know and we can tell her and thank her. But yeah, that, that's a powerful image that we come, have come back to many times after that. And we just didn't have a framework. We didn't have a vocabulary to even think about what was going on in our marriage. And because of the lack of privacy, the communal part was really, really good. You know, we were sitting with students around tables who were like, oh, I, you know, I, I one guy, Kabuki, he, you know, he was going to go back and tend his flock of 10,000, you know, in in um, Kenya. Was it Kenya? Uh, Congo. Congo. Yeah. You know, I mean, sitting around these conversations, Zaire, we really, it Congo, really yeah. was a cross section. And many of them were away from their families. And what do they love about seminary? Hot running water. You know, yeah. I mean, it was really an eye opener for us. And we discerned that that was not our call to be missionaries in France. Um, and we came back and that was clear. But I think a lot of other things got clear for us. And when we did get back, we were we we went right into counseling. And it was friends in seminary said, you know, these patterns are not really healthy. They don't seem to be resolving. Here's the name of a counselor. She's amazing. And so we one of the things I would say over the 45 years, hmm. we have learned that there are times when you can't get the objectivity you need. And it's really dangerous to go it alone. Marriage is not meant to go alone. And how do you know if your particular kind of conflict or whatever it is you're dealing with and the resolution of it might not be manna for somebody else? Um, it's a communal thing, maybe not to the degree that we did it at the time that we did it. That put an undue strain, I think, and maybe some would say wasn't wise. But we were protected and and preserved through it. But we we know, and we're not afraid to ask for help. We 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 quickly were disabused. You know, we wrote our own vows, like I said. We thought we knew what this was all about. And, <laughs> you know, we didn't. And um, and so we still know when to look for outside sources for help. And um there are times to do it together, and then there are times when you need to know when you need to own something that's that's you and um not about the couple it's about you so we haven't been afraid to do that i would say well, you know when we first got married again it was in the the mid 70s early 80s and there was a lot of um encouragement again you you pick up ideas uh, when you don't even realize it, it's like lint and you're picking up ideas from the zeitgeist around you. And it takes effort to kind of think about them and examine them and consider them and decide if that's really something you want to embrace. But um, there was a lot of talk about your soulmate and realizing your own fulfillment and, you know, to find someone who would be able to help you be, you know, uh, with your goals and your dreams. And um, that could be defined by anything, you know, it's sort of like whatever that person was into. Um, and there's a lot of idealize, uh, I, idealism in it, too, um, where um, you think that um, something that I'd like to come back to a little bit later, too, is that 
I don't think I realized that um, I looked to marriage as something to completely complete me. You know, these things that were the things that were lacking that I wanted, that I needed, um, that in a sense I might even th- think I thought were just part of the way it's supposed to be, and maybe even entitled to. Once I was in that kind of a relationship, and some of that stuff. Um, you know, Dallas Willard has had a huge Im- impact on us, um, Christian philosopher and theologian. And one of the things that I think about a lot still, but this was certainly true at, in the early years of our early time of our marriage. And since then, reality is what you run into when you're wrong. And so a lot of those conceptions hit reality. And thank goodness you know, they did because reality doesn't conform to the ideas that I brought into marriage initially in in, in a large part. I don't know. Yeah. I, I, I think, I think that's, I think that's right. Uh, um, trying to think about how to also think about this, your question. Um, I think also, um, in the early part, and I'm obviously early because I was, we're still work. I one of the things that, that it's, it's very, very clear to both of us is we've married 45 years because we've cared about our marriage for 45 years. We've never, we, we can never coast. We can never just assume, you know, you know, uh, we, we've got to be keep working at, um, my own growth, my taking responsibility for me, you know, what's happening inside of me. Mm-hmm. Um, I owe that to my partner in life to, to be able to art, to, to be able, and this is a challenge for me personally, to be able to articulate, What's happening with me? You know, some folks are, are maybe men. There's maybe something about men and women here, but you know, I think men maybe have it a diff, more difficult time accessing that and articulating that. Um, I think early on, um, I didn't realize how vitally important that was, but I was, I was certainly observing and experiencing the consequences of hitting that wall in communication with Suzanne. And, and then after a while of having to do some work, I realized I have got to take responsibility and I've got to go to work on this. And I feel like this today, I'm still working on this. I, I don't feel like I've arrived at all, but I'm still working on this because I know it really matters. And one of the things I would say in addition, so, so you know, in the middle years, just working on these things together, I think what's happened now more recently in the last years is that, um, and Susanna said this really well, uh, our, our sense of identity is really kind of settled. We know we're, we're Christ people. Um, and we, we have a sense of um, why we're on the planet. <laughs> why am I so emotional? Um, so that our marriage is f- m- much more now... Um, a partnership. Um, mm-hmm. We we were. I think you know. Suzanne said something when we first got. I can't. It might be before we got married. I never forgot. She says, you know. Uh, she said we're we're going to be shoulder to shoulder facing out. We're not going to be this enmeshed. We're going to be this facing out, facing toward what it is that the Christ has for us. Those are nice words at the beginning, you know. But it, it, over a long time, even decades, it really has become that for us. Uh, the one church where I, I, I accepted a call, um, I walked, figuratively speaking, I walked through the front door of the church and Suzanne walked through the back door. You know, she just would, she wanted to come in low key. Um, the last call I took as a pastor and, and this call, I think as well, we both walked through the front door together. And that's that's a change for us in in our in our marriage over over the years. You know, I, and I would I would just add that <clears throat> when you gave us some questions to kind of just think about about how this conversation might go, I wrote one thing down that isn't something that I came to on my own, but has received wisdom. Um, and um, you know, one thing I would highly recommend for anyone interested in marriage is this book by Tim and um, Kathy Keller called The Meaning of Marriage has been extremely helpful to us. And we've walked with young couples going toward marriage um, um, using this book as our as our study. But um, I would say that um, those early ideas of marriage that were idealistic, um, I would call myself a recovering idealist. 
And I think of myself now as a hopeful realist. That's mm. what I aspire to, which is I'd much rather live in the real, um, the real realities of who I am and where I need to grow in him and what life is like out here with the hope that Christ is in us and working through us than I would any trying to make our marriage conform to some preconceived idea. But in terms of where I think we have moved toward by God's grace and, and working through other people and through his word, um, you know, you asked us to think about what is the meaning of marriage. And um, I just wanted to share this. I wrote it down because if I get emotional, I want to be able to say the whole thing, just that I know it was God's original idea um, and that marriage is one of God's strategies, just one. It's not the only strategy for the long, slow work of reciprocal um, human character formation mm -hmm. um, in the fine texture of daily life, because that's where we really need to rub up against other people and have those edges knocked off and come to light. Um, and its essential purpose is for each person in the marriage to help the other become who God intends them to be. That didn't come into focus for us, you know, with the clarity I wish it had, um, but it did come into focus. So I'm clearer that, you know, the love, the bond of love, of course, but we had a lot of the ideas from the culture of how that should look and how it should feel. And, that, and it was two feelings based, I think. And the idea of love that's been the most freeing and enduring is uh, seeking the good of the other. Mm -hmm. And feelings are a byproduct of that. And you know, intensity of feelings and the kind of feelings and everything that characterize different stages of marriage, you know, they come and go and they can morph. But if you're seeking the good of the other sincerely, I think you come to love them in a different way. And um, mm. that's what creates the covenant within which it's safe to be who you really are and to be able to, by the Holy Spirit working through one to the other, we're supposed to become more who we're intended to be. And that that's more how I think about it now. That's what, how it's changed. I'm going to build on that. Um, it, it, the seeking the good of the other, make the, you know, seeking the good of the other, you know, I'm trying to make this concrete. Um, it, what, it, for me, uh, one, one place where this really lands in seeking the good of Suzanne is me showing up, um, me listening, me being fully present to Suzanne when she is working something out. She's got a pro she, she, she Suzanne needs to process. A lot of us are like this. Most of us are like this. We've got to process by by dialogue. And 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 the other has got it in the, the gift of the seeking the good of the other. The gift is to bring self to that conversation, to listen with the full presence of, of your person so that the other person knows I know I'm being heard. Is a, an amazing sacrificial that's an act of, of, of self-sacrifice, of setting myself aside to listen, to take in what Suzanne says. It's something I have, to, I, I, I work at this. And I wanna add one more thing here um, that, that I, has been so helpful to me, and I just wanna share this uh, with, 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 with folks. Um, one of the reasons that's hard to take in the other is, especially when it's your spouse, is you feel terribly vulnerable. Because this other person knows you so well, you know, you know where all the cracks and the crannies and the skeletons and the cobwebs, and you know, she just knows me better than anybody on the planet, and and I her. Um, it makes for a tremendous uh, feeling of it could be used, and, and and when that happens, trust is just broken. Um, so that feeling of vulnerability is is a powerful thing, and how to how to deal with that. Um, what I've, I've learned is that um, if my left hand is, is me and my right hand is Christ and I accept Christ in my life, I become this, that nothing can separate me from the love of God. Nothing, not even a difficult conversation, <laughs> not even a conversation with my wife where she knows me so well, where I can feel shame. I can feel I have so messed up and I, why in the world would you want to be married to me? 
And when I get into that kind of space, I'm not helping anybody. But when I remember that this is who I am, that I am loved of God, I am loved of Christ, and nothing is separate. I am a loved person. That empowers me to be in those difficult conversations. See? I can actually think, okay, Lord, it's you and me in this. I'm okay. I'm going to be okay. Even when hard things are being said. It's been very important for me. In, in, in my ability to love my wife. To seek her good. One of the questions you asked us to think about was, um, it's like, what did you bring? What did you bring into the marriage that complicated it? That's a really good question, I think. And for me, um, being such a new Christian, not having been formed in a faith community, the issue of identity was really kind of up for grabs. And identity uh, formation is such a part of young adulthood. You know, who am I? Am I defined by my work? Am I defined by... You know, there's so many things we can be at risk for being defined by our, our political affiliation, you know, our, you know, our, our status, our socioeconomic, you know, our earning power there, you know, for both men and women, they might, some of them are very much the same, but the culture would like to clamor for getting a claim, I think, on us. And that was just as true for us. And so I, my identity was not rooted, let's put it that way. I think there was a part of me that was looking to uh, root my identity in marriage. And it's not meant to bear that weight. Because then if it's, you know, if it's rocky or it's not what I thought it might be and all these things, then it's like, wow, well, then then who am I? And then mm. my jobs, I had real, uh, vo I, I had a lot of trouble with vocational clarity. I wasn't one who came to it quickly, like, oh, some of my friends, I want to be a nurse, I want to be a doctor, I want to be, it came, the vocational clarity, and I would envy that so much because it seemed like, ah, oh, that's their identity. So mine was painful in, in coming to some kind of clarity, and it never had that quality of, I can easily walk into a room and say, well, you know, I'm a neuroscientist, and I, you know, <laughs> I it never came to that degree of, of clarity. Um, but, you know, a book that I really want and being impacted by now, and I'm so excited because Dick said, I want to do this book with you. It's called Healthy Me, Healthy Us. And it's written by um, Dr. Les and Leslie Parrott, and they're Christian psychologists. And just like Paul in Ephesians, you know, a primary text in Scripture that we've been aspiring to live under for 40 for almost 45 years, um, they've structured this book around Ephesians. And, um, and you know, right in the title, if you want to have a healthy, he healthy relationships, I would say this across the board, if you want to have healthy friendships and work relationships, but for sure a healthy marriage, um, think about how healthy you are. And they're meaning this in the holistic term. And one of the very first things they say, they have three key hallmarks of health. I won't go into all of them, but the first one is to grapple with your sense of significance and where you're deriving it. And they said, apart from a sense of deep personal significance, you will be at risk for spending your life with the compulsion for completion and mm. looking for that significance to be found in something else or someone else or to be achieved by something. And none of it will be able to deliver what we need, which is a rootedness. And I, I mean, they've written it really well. I actually remember some of these things. And I, I'm, I'm an underliner and I have to go back and read and reread. But, you know, they're, and this is taught so beautifully from, from the, the, the people who preach at this church. The teaching is so wise and so good and so biblically grounded. Um, so you hear this all the time if you're here, but I can't overstate it with regard to relationships and with marriage, and that is that our significance is received, not achieved, and it's not to be found in something else. And I would say a good deal of the hmm. turmoil and the the challenges that we had that a, a lot that I brought was I wasn't rooted. 
Uh, and I'm, that was so slow in coming, so slow and painful. And it caused a lot of pain for Dick. I think he came to it much earlier than I did. And so he had to endure the um, effects of a person really kind of just uh, in a process of just seeking that, you know, and never finding the rest. And then in mothering. And that's a danger, too, because then what? Then your kids can become almost idols. Then you're at risk for idolatry because any of anything else is lesser. So grapple with where you're deriving your significance. Mm. And I urge you to, you know, to consider what the Bible says, which is you are significant because I he created you and you... Uh, you are called in whatever relationship you're in with whatever work you do or don't do, whatever capacities you do or don't have, you have been equipped and gifted to participate in bringing my kingdom here. And that's there's nothing more enduring. So it's really securing. Yeah, so it, it took a while for me to get kind of settled. And I would say another of your questions is, how is your marriage different now than it was then? I would say a lot of the turmoil around those issues is much less prevalent. We still have it. It's like, well, that didn't go very well. Or, you know, we're back from Florida now, and I kind of had found my footing with a bi women's Bible study. I'm new to this church. It's big. But I heard the sermon last week, and they're like, you know, Carolyn and Takeda spoke into it, and Sean, and they're like, and I'm in the 301 class. You have a ministry. Find it. So <laughs> I'm I'm leaning in there. Um, but I my whole significance doesn't depend on it. It gets uh, worked out through it, so it could, there can be disappointments along the way. You know, I'm in conversation with young adults. You know, we have a daughter. We've, you know, walked through seasons of, you know, friends and groups of friends and people being around us. And because we're in the church, we are in ongoing conversation with people, you know, across the spectrum. And we've seen how things have changed and. I've spent a fair amount of time. Um, my background, my 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 training was in human development, and I'm really really interested in how people grow, and and now much more interested in how people grow spiritually. And this whole arena, I ache, I ache for the cultural context for people um, trying to who who would desire to to marry. Um, and um, are wanting to be prepared for that and navigate these the terrain. Terrain has changed a lot. It's a lot harder, and it's a lot more of a marketplace than it used to be for both men mm. and women, and it's harsh. I think it's really harsh. And so I thank God for anyone who can find a context of a faith community where you're reminded you're in more normalized relationships, but, you know, it comes there too. But I would say... Following up on this book, Healthy Me, Healthy Us, if you're interested in marrying, um, find out what it means to be healthy emotionally, mm -hmm. psychologically, spiritually. Really, I don't mean come to some point of perfection where it has to be put off so long because you're still working on yourself. But there are some major issues to sort through, and 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 a book like you know healthy healthy me healthy us, they have all these you know very specific exercises you can go through. So one of them is they say tune into your self talk. They give you an assessment tool. You log on, you do an assessment tool, and tune into how you view yourself because that that issue of significance is going to come into play there. Yeah. And if you feel like you're competing with an entire region of people, whether you're male or female, and how the the online marketplace, it, it's an essential tool now. It's not going away. But there are some unique um, hazards, I would say, to it. And the hazards are the harm it can do to your own sense of yourself. Um, um, so that would be one. Um, grapple with identity and significance and being healthy. Another one would be do not. Ignore yellow caution flags. Do not ignore red flags. Lean in and really think about it. Trust your gut. And um, all of us in 
are, are none of us are our best self all the time. So there are episodic kinds of behavioral things, and there are chronic behavioral things. And I think that's an important distinction. Um, there are some things that are disappointing. There are some patterns or, mm. you know, behavioral things that are um, discouraging, maybe. And then there are some that can be destructive. And that's in any any relationship. It's important for us to tune in in the workplace and, you know, but do dig there. What what are destructive relationship patterns? And then give enough time. Right. That's where our story is kind of a cautionary tale because it's there, but by the grace of God, go we. Uh, we didn't really, I don't think we gave it enough time. And I don't mean like five years, 10. I mean, some of these, you know, it's, there are some things you can do to make the time really count if you're intentional, but you need enough time to be able to see a person over time in a variety of contexts and yourself. And um, I would say that there's no perfect match. You know, I kind of, one of my hobbies, I love these assessment tools like the Myers-Briggs type indicator, the Enneagram, you know, I, I've, I, you know, but they're just frameworks for giving a vocabulary for talking about different ways of being. And I think sometimes, and I think I, this happened for me at different times, where you want to use them to maybe control that outcome and make sure you can assure you're going to get just the right match. And I, I would say that if you're dating or you're, you're in a relationship with a good person, and by that I mean a person who, you know, is faithful and growing and is basically healthy, and you are too, um, that any match is going to have strengths and struggles. It'll be just unique to that particular fit or that pattern. I believe God made us with internal patterns, ways of being, just like there are all different kinds of roses and there are all different kinds, and all the rest of his creation, there are patterns that can be identified. The danger is to pin people into a box in the pattern and not leave room for them to grow. That's not what it's intended for. It's intended to provide sort of a sense of a low resolution picture is how, you know, one teacher about the Enneagram and life talks about it. It's kind of a low resolution. It gives you a hint of, oh, like, you know, Dick's more extroverted. I'm more introverted. That's not about social capacity. That's about energy management. You know, we both like to bring things to closure and make lists and get things done. Um, we don't have sort of the open-ended, more easy, easy going kind of person. That has a strength and a struggle to it. We're both drawn to more, you know, ideas and possibilities and things. And neither of us were very good at some of the more practical, how do you do these things? You know, strengths and struggles. There were compatibilities, but struggles, that's okay. That can be navigated. Um, so... Let me let me take a stab at this. Those are a few, just a few things that I wish someone had told us. <laughs> I, I I I agree. Amen to everything that that, that Suzanne said. I'm, I'm going to take another tack on this, um, um, and I I, I want to propose that there is the uh, eight second rule. The eight second rule is physical attraction, and there is there is that there is this attraction, it, and it, it's it's good for about eight seconds, and it's followed by the eight minute rule which is eight minutes of initial conversation to find out if, if, if you're even interested in pursuing this, this person. Is this person interesting beyond physical attraction? Is this person interesting to you? Followed by the eight hour rule, which is spending some time together, probably whatever, they, whatever that might look like, a bike ride, you know, whatever it might be, spending some, some time together, just getting to know each other, that eight hour rule then has to be followed by an eight day rule. You get the idea. And I would say an eight week, an eight month, can't go years. Keep taking <laughs> soundings. Yeah. Um, it, it's just, in other words, not to be in a hurry and to keep allowing the, the relationship to, to, to grow and deepen. And, and like Suzanne said so well, pay attention to yellow flags, um, a, a sense of, uh oh, a sense of that I I don't feel free with this person. I have a, I have a sense that this person is trying to fix me. That's a yellow flag, and you may not know what that's all about, but pay attention to that flag. It may be uh, the signal I need to kind of slow, at minimum slow this thing down, and maybe this relationship needs to end. Um, I just think what, what Suzanne's saying is right. Or 
get outside input. Yeah, and, and being in a community uh, is a very important part of this as well. Not just doing solo, but just a, like a, a, a robust community like Calvary and in the YA community is a very important part of this as well. Yeah. I would also say to somebody who had a, you know, had, uh, you know, had a hope or aspiration to be married, um, that um, taking time, you know, it doesn't even mean when we would get together with young couples um, to, to study who were actually engaged to be married, and we would go through this book, The Meaning of Marriage, for example, um, we would just, we would make the case you may not agree with what you, we're reading here. You know, it's not, that's not contingent, but we want to make sure that you've had an opportunity to understand what God intends, what his purposes were and his guidance for it. And, um, I would encourage you to consider why God put the guidelines down that he did, um, for navigating the terrain, um, of, of intimate relationships and physical intimacy, and to um, come to understand that he is not a a mean rule giver who just wants to see if we can, you know, um, pass some kind of impossible test. I really think that the guidelines and the boundaries that he gives are protective, and. Uh, they're not meant. They're meant to be protective, not restrictive. That any restriction is protective in its aim, and I don't think I really understood that for a really long time. And you rarely hear an account given on what's God's heart. He created us. He created us um, with with a certain nature, and He knows us best. And He knows this terrain, the terrain of marriage, and the terrain leading up to marriage. So at least give it some deep consideration. Ask lots of questions. Argue about it. You know, um, uh, get with other people who are thinking about it. But at least there's, you know, there are a lot of things on offer, I think, culturally, um, of what marriage is, what it's about, you know, why it matters, and all these other things. Um, but at least take the time. You'll be doing yourself a huge favor, favor to try to understand what, what, what the biblical account is for marriage, and, and just and just to st maybe state the obvious um, in in the the beginning of, of of the maybe in the initial encounter relationship conversation to find out if there is a, a common ground in in faith in Christ and trust in Christ. Do you share Christ in common? Mm -hmm. uh, I I can just I can't emphasize enough. You know, I've seen couples get married where that's not they're not on the same page with regard to their commitment to Christ. And that's hard. It's not impossible, but it's much harder. And if you have Christ as, a, as you can see, you confess Christ as your Lord and Savior together, and you worship together, and the community is all shared together. That is really facilitates getting through all kinds of things that happen in marriage. Um, so that common ground and just common faith—you share the same the faith—is is, is is very important. About Suzanne, I, I, she's my partner in life, and, and Suzanne is a, a beautiful person. I'm very attracted to Suzanne just as a person, you know, physically attracted to her. I think she's a beautiful person, um, and um, I, I love I love how she um, uh, is a, a mom, and now she's a Gigi. And uh, my 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 dear wife is a toddler whisperer. She has this amazing wavelength with her grandson, who's four and a half years old. And to watch her create environments, Suzanne has always been a person who cares about the environment that we're in and making it a nurturing, evocative kind of a space. And uh, we've always, this has always been true for Suzanne. So um, I, her, she's an artist when it comes to these things. And I just, I take a great joy in that. And with regard to uh, what I would want to just to share with YA people is um, you are so intensely beyond words, love of God. Um, um, for, for, for you to, to, uh, just to know that, um, that the, you've, you hear it all the time here at Calvary, you know, the, 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 the God loves you in Christ who died for you and then rose for you and has life in mind for you that begins your eternal life begins the moment you say yes to Christ. 
and that is who you are. And, uh, and, and this, one more thing, then I'll, I'll stop, is our identities in Christ are unclear to us, and that's okay. Mm. That's okay, because we don't know who we are, but we can trust him because he knows who we are, and we can live into that. And it'll get clearer to us as we go along, as we roll along. I guess that's been my experience that I've, I've gotten clearer about who I am, but I don't, I don't have it all like nailed. And I'm okay with that because he knows who I am. And just to mm -hmm. get on with life because you can trust him with your identity and your love of God. Mm -hmm. That's it for me. What do you like about this? Yeah. Right yeah. Now. Well, you know, right, you know, right <laughs> yeah, from what the are you say? <laughs> No, right from right from the start. I mean, it was clear in InterVarsity, you know, that there was this, you know, sort of missing person, you know, and they were really well when, you know, Dick Thompson gets back and he came back and it's true there was sort of a um, you know, a gentle um but uh um, you know, catalytic quality um, of being around him. It's easy, but it goes someplace. You know, there's, it, it, it's going somewhere, you know, and, um, and that has, that is very, very attractive. And I was thinking about this a little bit. I was thinking, not in terms of role, but I was thinking if you were going to say which biblical character first comes to mind with regard to the two of you, I would say I'm kind of like Simon the Zealot, a um, little less of the Zealot now, a little more tempered. And he's like Barnabas, you know, the encourager. Um, and I've been in my family of origin was really complicated. My 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 dad suffered from alcoholism and terrible abuse from his family of origin. It was a big, complicated family. And um, that's one of the things I brought into the marriage, sort of this hypervigilance, you know, um, and, and, and anxiety uh, that goes with that terrain. Mm -hmm. And I, I met Dick and really had never been in conversation or certainly not in any kind of an extended relationship with a person who extends naturally um, so much grace. And it took me really, I think, a long time to receive more of that love. And it's, and that's part of his role in my life, I now understand, is to help me settle in understanding my eternal significance before God. I know that because of how he treats me. Um, and I woke up maybe two years into the marriage. This may be a little bit of an exaggeration. And I remember kind of having this realization like, you wake up, it's kind of like reality is more settling in. And it's like, thank goodness, I married a good person. That's one thing I would say, you know, think about what is a good person. I mean, a lot of things can get worked out with a good person. And I'm so grateful because his goodness has been a big part and because he's been actively seeking God in his life from the beginning we have this new phrase in our family we heard a pastor say it recently about after COVID their church was going to fumble forward I said I love that we've been fumbling forward from the beginning <laughs> <laughs> so as we celebrate our 45th year coming up in May we have more permission to fumble forward but I can trust you know him and uh and he has been an he's an amazing um gracious husband he's a, an amazing gracious father and grandfather and the whole world stops when granddad is on the scene uh for our grandson i'm so grateful cuz we get to see each other in sort of a new role and um yeah, sure. and he's fun and he loves to talk about ideas we can when we would talk when we'd get together to study you know we could go into this you know little room where we could listen to music and stuff and i mean we could not stop talking there was never an end to the kinds of things that were interesting to us and that's still true um we we love uh and now the context is Right now, there's a lot of conversation around Calvary and getting to know it, but what might seasoned adult ministry look like and how that's our, that's our terrain. You know, what does it look like to be faithful in that terrain? There's so much to discover and explore. And I'm very, very grateful that, um, he came back from France at the right time. And if he had been there his junior year, it might not have been, 
you know, an opportunity for me to get to know him at that very strategic turning point. So mm. I'm very grateful to God. 